I have a very warm fraternal feeling for the Asia Society, and I have for 30 odd years, and I do mean odd, since we came back to the States. From the days when Bob Oxnum was uh, head of the China Council, and we were living in the Northeast and used to do quite a lot with the Asia Society. Because we're really in the same business. We're both in the business of building bridges, <clears throat> which, as has been mentioned, I've been working at for 70 years. Uh, long enough to be better at it, but never mind that. Uh, there is really no good reason in the world why Americans and Asians, and specifically Americans and Chinese, should not be the greatest of friends. There's no economic reason, there's no moral reason, there's no political or social reason. And yet, there are many people, many forces in this country and some in China, but I think not as many as we have here, who work against and speak against the building of this friendship. And I think that's perhaps the main reason why the work of the Asia Society is so important, to bring the truth about Asia and about China to Americans, particularly to influential Americans who can play a role in building and supporting and broadening this bridge than which I think there's nothing really more important, nothing on the agenda of the whole world. What a path we've come across already, what a tremendous amount of progress we've made in the last 70 years. From the time when I went to China as a GI in 1945, when the average life expectancy of a Chinese baby was 31 to 32 years old, to today where it's 74. Or from in America, when I was studying Stan uh, Chinese at Stanford, you could ride on a local bus and with my fellow, stu fellow students, we could talk about people or things in Chinese, absolutely certain that nobody would understand what we were saying. <laughs> Most people would not even know what language we were talking. Well, today, you cannot do that anymore. <laughs> the blonde, blue-eyed girl sitting right across the aisle on the bus may be studying Mandarin today. It's a total change. It's the beginning of a sea change. And I think one of the most important things that we can do is get more of our people to go there and get more of their people to come here and to receive the impact of not just the great art treasures and the uh, economic progress and so on. You know, we don't have a single, those of you that have been to China lately know that, we don't have a single airport in this country that can compare in any way to any number of new modern airports in China. I mean, shabby is the word, really. <laughs> Sorry to say it, but it is. And we're the richest country in the world. But it seems to me there are things that we can learn about that. There are things that we can learn. There are fires that we can rekindle that are burned very low. And we have, my, my fellow honoree who just spoke here tonight is one of these great fire kindlers, as is our friend Gary Rochelle. There's so much to learn. There's so much to enjoy. There's so much to benefit from. And all of all of the great issues that really could threaten the very existence of our species on Earth, not one can be addressed without close collaboration 
between these two countries, between China and the United States. Not climate change, not terrorism plus weapons of mass destruction, not pandemic diseases, not even the teetering of the world financial system. They all need us to work together. Well, there are many things that we don't agree on. There are many ways of life that we're not accustomed to and find it hard to accept. Well, the answer to that is that all concern, just get over it. <laughs> just get over it. When you come to my house to dinner, I don't expect you to go poking around in the kitchen to see how I fix my food. And when I go to your house, unless it's Gary and Yuka's house, I don't go poking around in your kitchen. We find it hard to accept their one-child family. They find our one-parent family totally beyond comprehension. <laughs> you know, they have terrible human rights issues and atrocities. Have you been in East Harlem or East LA? So, you know, just get over it. Don't allow our differences to block out the fact that the, on the great issues, we share a common destiny. And the more we're able and the sooner we're able to recognize that and act on it, the better off we'll all be. Working for on this kind of bridge building that you do has made my life a very, very interesting and a very happy one, all in all. A very fulfilling one. Plus, <laughs> it brought me my dream girl of 57 years. Stand up. Now this, I submit, is a genuine hero. This is a genuine hero. A Chinese woman married to an imperialist spy who's in prison, who keeps insisting that my husband is a good man, is beaten, is spit on, is fined, is given years of very, very hard labor. So to this day, she still carries the back strain and the wrist strain that she received in those, in those years of cruelty. Never bowed her head. Never failed to teach our four children, don't listen, your father is a good man. Don't argue with him, but don't listen. <laughs> this is a real hero. And this is a blessing that I received from working on U.S.-China friendship. So from the bottom of my heart, I thank you, the Asia Society, for this gift of recognition. And I will use it to put more fuel into our efforts at bridge building. Thank you very much.